Hey folks, welcome to Behind the Headlines. This is our interview series. I have an incredible guest for you today. I'm really excited about this one. This is the host of the Gorilla History podcast, and uh, I'll, I'll introduce them in a moment, but um, I wanted to explain that we're doing something a bit unique this week. We're going to do kind of a co-interview where uh, they're interviewing me, I'm interviewing them. We kind of go back and forth. We're going to we're just gonna we're just gonna bat the ball around and see what happens, and I feel like it'll be a really fun and exciting uh, way to do it. So I hope you enjoy that. But to explain a little more, uh, Gorilla History Podcast is an outstanding podcast. I maybe many of you may already listen to it, but if you don't, it involves three co-hosts: immunobiologist Henry Hakamaki. Professor Adnan Hussein, historian and director of the School of Religion at Queen's University, and revolutionary left radio's Brett O'Shea. And uh, Grill History Podcast is, is what I would call a correction of global history, uh, setting the record straight for the activist left. And it uses, as they say, the lessons of history to analyze the present. And they always do an excellent job of it. So we figured, why not... Get everybody together and do it as one big joint thing, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, so let's let's bring them all in. Henry, Adnan, and Brett, welcome. Hello, Lee. Great to be with you, Lee. Yeah, it's yeah, a real pleasure. Th th thanks for thanks for doing this. Uh, the, the, you know, as I was explaining, that I haven't done one like this before, but uh, I th I think it'll be pretty cool and pretty fun. And I, I don't know if uh, if if you guys wanted to introduce anything. I know you you may uh, since this is also going to be uh, your interview. Uh, I want to allow you to do that. So yeah, I guess just briefly, I'll I'll just pitch what the show is for everybody in case they haven't already checked out Guerrilla History. So as Lee mentioned, we're a, a global history podcast. We call ourselves a global proletarian history podcast that really focuses on movements and people. Uh, and we are looking from an unabashedly anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist lens to really reframe the contextualization of history to really get into that nuance in some cases or go to places that people don't even typically hear about. So we have members of the Communist Party of Kenya that'll come on. We had Comrade Joma, the founding chairman of the Communist Party of the Philippines come on. Uh, we've had guerrilla, guerrillas with the Red Army faction in West Germany, and we also have academics like Gerald Horn and Richard Wolff come on. So we really have a broad swath, but the overarching theme is anti-capitalism and anti-imperialism and centering people's movements. Yeah, and, and you guys do an excellent job of it. Um, well, I guess I'll, I'll start out with uh, the, the first question, and I know it's... It's insultingly broad, but I figured I would start broad and then we can narrow it down. Um, I wanted to hear your your view on how how history, if you could explain how history can be used as propaganda and how we're seeing it being used as propaganda in our world today. And I, I know that's broad, but I think a lot of people that maybe are not, you know, weren't weren't big history buffs in school, uh, think, well, history is history. And, you know, it, 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 it just is what it is. But uh, it's obviously far more complicated than that. Well, as a professor of history, I confront this problem a lot, that <laughs> what people think history is uh, yeah. from what they've absorbed broadly in the culture is always, um, you know, a mixture of a myth that includes genuine historical details, but placed in a kind of framework to convey a certain ideological message, or it's selective because whole aspects of people's experiences and important developments from the past are simply left out or ignored and marginalized. Um, or, uh, you know, it's um, a kind of um, disinformation sort of uh, game. And I think, I guess to sort of frame the whole problem, I would say history is so important because it's what grounds our identities um, as people, you know, your own biography and family history, but your mm -hmm. community, your society, your nation, all these kind of collective ideas of affiliation and connection that we have together 
also have their histories that are told about that, that give it some kind of meaning and shape. And so the kind of history that's told, how it's framed and shaped is so important for who we understand ourselves to be. And that's why it's such a contested ground. That's why CRT is such an important kind of discourse on the far right in the United States is not because it's some legal theory about critical race ideas and how they're applied into legal institutions, but because it's a broad way of framing the problem of not wanting other histories told about the United States and accepted in the education system. It has nothing to do with CRT itself. It has everything to do with history. And so that's why it's so important. But where it's used as propaganda, I think there's so many uh, you know, examples yeah. of this today. We are dealing with um, in information society of the present um, with disinformation, misinformation, and the same happens in articulating history for the reasons that I said, that it's it can be used to ground people's identity and it can also be used in war propaganda, for example. So in the Ukraine situation, um, you know, this is a complex place that has a long history. It's a divided society and culture with different languages. Um, you know, it's kind of a strange country that is divided in some ways by East and West, by its connection to Russia, but also by its connections, historically speaking, to Poland and, you know, parts of what we think of as Eastern Europe and the old Austro-Hungarian, uh, you know, empire and so on. It's got a very mixed and divided history. And what we're told when it comes to nationalism, which I think is the real big problem with where use and abuse of history takes place, yeah. is that there's only one particular kind of identity that's being included in this vision of what is Ukrainian history. And the idea, you know, that there are Ukrainians who you know, have different affiliations somehow can't be reconciled into this concept of Ukraine as a nation, because it's supposed to be one people, only the right. Ukrainian language, only one certain kind of history. And as a result, you have things that are left out or uh, altered. Um, and, you know, this is part of what fuels uh, the nationalism and, you know, what's left out so often from our, you know, uh, understanding of this history is like the World War II experience. I mean, it's being invoked to say Putin is like Hitler, we can't appease, and to invoke that you know dimension of it. And yet the other side of the same World War II history is being suppressed, that there is a tradition of far-right ultra-Ukrainian nationalism that saw itself as you know, needing to expunge the Poles, the Jews, the, the, the Russians, and you know, we're dealing with those legacies. There's no way to actually figure out what's happening in this situation if we don't take into account a fuller and more complete picture of that history to then deal with how it's being used in the present in order to come up with, you know, a much better analysis. So I think that's a great example yeah. of history being used as propaganda. Yeah. And I think that the nationalism aspect is a great point because I remember hearing that it was a quote from someone who lived in the Donbass region. And they said, you know, uh, we, we, we don't view, you know, this, this particular family said, we don't view ourselves as Ukrainian. We were living here and then people put a border there. And at first the border didn't matter, matter much. People went back and forth all day long and we have family on each side. And, and then the border started to matter more and more. And then one day someone said, well, you're Ukrainian, your family over there is Russian and you hate each other. And <laughs> they, it, 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 that's, that's what nationalism does. It divides people, puts people together who might hate each other. And, and, and we're supposed to believe that everyone within these precise borders are one thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, another thing nationalism does, of course, and especially with the telling of history, is obscures the role of class. So if you can, if, like in America, for example, we're all Americans, we're all one family. That obscures the role that the elite and the capitalist class, the owning class, has over the working class, and to say nothing of, of the poor. So nationalism always obscures class, and so we should be on the left very suspicious of various forms of nationalism, especially in the imperial core. But I wanted to give a couple examples to what Adnan said about the way history is used as a propaganda tool. One of the obvious ways, just for any American, is just the telling of American history 
as if it was a, a, a inevitable path of progress. There were some ugly parts in the past, but more or less we've overcome them. Maybe we're still overcoming the last residues of them. Um, but, you know, progress is baked into the cake and we're all one family and things have gotten much, much better. And that's a story that is very soothing to people who are elite or people who want to believe that story, who are comfortable enough to be able to enjoy that fourth grade history sort of story we tell about ourselves. Right. But another really big example I wanted to put on the table, and this might lead well into Henry's um, response, is uh, the way that uh, socialism and communism are, are equalized with fascism. Now, we know on the left, whatever your thoughts on communist movements are, socialist movements are, uh, we know on the left that that is the world historical movement that fought fascism upon its rise during its reign and ultimately ended it. It was the Soviets who marched into Berlin, who liberated the Holocaust camps, who fought fascists in the streets in Germany, you know, German leftist, German communist fighting fascists in the street as they were rising out of the Weimar Republic. But what we see today, and you can go on any forum, you can Google this and you'll see something like this, a brutal dictator list, right? Uh, who are the worst dictators of the 20th century or of all of history? You'll always see um, communist and socialist leaders uh, lumped in with a Hitler, for example. In fact, if you go onto Google and you search the worst dictators of the 20th century, Hitler will be like three or four <laughs> and Stalin and Mao will always be number one. Now, really quickly, I don't want to get too deep into this, but just on the Mao front, right? Um, you know, Hitler has an ideology of genocide. He wants to use industrialization to slaughter the scapegoats that he views as the problem, right? Jewish people and then uh, some other uh, subcategories, marginalized communities, etc. The goal of communism, even with all of its flaws, is about equality, about justice, about ending class hierarchy in the world. And so you look at something like the Cultural Revolution. That was a low level civil war within China. Right. Everybody that's that died in that conflict is laid at the feet of Mao. Mao's, Mao is responsible for all of these deaths. That's like laying the deaths of 600 plus thousand Americans in the Civil War at the foot of Lincoln and saying Lincoln is responsible for 600,000 deaths. Right. Um, and then with the Great Leap Forward, this is an attempt um, by the Chinese communists, of course, to uh, let the masses participate in the revolutionizing of their society. People died, mistakes were made, errors happened, but that was never the intention of anyone. And so when you place communists next to fascists, you are playing the fascist game of saying the people who are most vociferously against fascism, who are willing to fight fascists every step of the way, are just as bad as the fascists themselves. And that is just one way in which history is contorted and warped to fit a, an ostensibly liberal program, because liberals don't like that far left either, but it actually ends up feeding into fascist propaganda. Yeah, and just to hop in on that point, in terms of history as propaganda, uh, Brett lays out some really great examples. And I, before I, I hit another concrete example, I, I just also want to mention something that you, that you said, Lee, about people from the Donbass or other regions like this that didn't necessarily see themselves as Ukrainian. They were just people there. I mean, I have a concrete example of this myself. My wife is Crimean Tatar. She was raised in Crimea. Uh, we now live in Russia. I know you always uh, opened your old show with, you know, you're a Russian asset because you were being hosted by RT. Now you're a Russian asset because you're talking to somebody who lives in Russia. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, in, in any well, case, I, I don't think I'm legally allowed to speak to anyone in Russia. I don't we oh, might have well, to this now. <laughs> sorry to break it to you. In any case, uh, you know, my my wife's I guess it would be her great aunt. She calls her her grandma because there's no distinction in Russian. She was a partisan spy for the Red Army that was tortured and executed by the Nazis when she was 20 years old. She was from the area of Crimea. She didn't see herself as, you know, Ukrainian or Russian. She was Crimean and she was a member of the Soviet Union. They were all fighting for the same proletarian cause and against fascism. It was only later on that these national borders became distinct that there was any issue. And it's important that people understand that when we look at referenda results, you know, there are independent observers that went in and looked at, at the referenda that took place. And yes, there were some abnormalities. There were some, uh, you know, techniques that may not be super savory, but the vast majority of independent observers found that upwards of 90% of people in Crimea wanted to be part of Russia. And this is the experience that we've heard. Right. But turning towards another concrete example in terms of history as propaganda, 
It also allows me to pitch a project that I'm working on. We're in the final stage of editing a new translation from the original tr uh, Italian of Domenico Lasordo's Stalin, History and Critique of a Black Legend, which takes this on exactly in terms of how propaganda can be used to skew the narrative surrounding either a movement or in this case, a specific figure, and then be used as a cudgel against a political movement that would be associated with this person. So communism is always beaten down as uh, it's Stalinist. Well, Domenico Lasordo does a very extensive job in this work, which will be available for free as a PDF or low cost as a print edition for anybody who's looking for it. It'll be out in a month or two from Peaceland Bread and their imprint Iskra books. So just look for that or I'll tweet it out when it's ready. But chapter five of this book nails the example that Brett uh, mentioned of conflating Hitler with Stalin exactly. Chapter five is the erasure of history and construction of mythology, Stalin and Hitler as twin monsters. And it's just this tour de force completely taking apart this narrative. Now, I know that we've talked on this topic for a while, so I won't go into taking apart this. I will just direct people, hey, you're going to have a free PDF as a resource from Peaceland Bread uh, in, in about a month or two. Again, just keep your eyes peeled for that. But we do have these concrete examples of how propaganda can become hegemony and hegemony then through narratives can skew the perception of history and uh, skew perceptions of movements, which actually brings me up to the point that I want to ask you, Lee, uh, in terms of our first question for you. Sounds good. Censorship. You know, we're talking about propaganda and media narratives. Censorship also plays a big role in this. And I know that this is something that you experience firsthand. So, you know, what are your thoughts on what we've kind of been talking about? And then also bringing in that, that, that angle of censorship and your personal experience with that. You know, how do you perceive this censorship regime, this media regime, this hege hegemonic media narrative that we have? How does that impinge uh, people's understanding of real events? Yeah, well, well, thanks. And and <clears throat> of course, it's the censorship we've seen in the United States is uh, incredibly important, it, it, important to the ruling elite to have their uh, their view of the world, the one they're trying to to put out uh, to be front and center and, and make sure there aren't too many competing viewpoints out there. Uh, I think the, the U.S. kind of does censorship better than perhaps most countries uh, in that the, the vast majority of it is not deleting someone or or in my case, having my YouTube channel banned globally, the Redacted Tonight channel banned globally. That type of thing is done as kind of a last resort. Uh, you know, it's 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 when the the earlier attempts, the the white blood cells of the ruling elite have failed in their attempt to attack the infection. And they ultimately will do something that blatant. You know, if you go to my YouTube channel, it just says banned in your country or whatever. Can't be viewed in your country. But in general, most of the censorship, the vast majority is done by the, the corporate system that, of course, runs our media. But, you know, we, we live in inverted totalitarianism. So it's the corporate state that also owns the media. So in many ways, U.S. media is state media and people just don't realize it. Uh, but. Most of the censorship is these journalists and, you know, at times, I suppose you can factor in a comedian in there as well. But for the most part, journalists or reporters or, or people that are presenters on these shows, they wouldn't have gotten to that spot. And this the same much of this goes for Congress as well. You know, they wouldn't have gotten to that position that they're on CNN or some of the biggest platforms in the world unless they had shown throughout their early career that they were willing to just put forward almost exclusively the talking points of the U.S. empire. Uh, you, if you go against that, if they'd been beating against that on their way up, the way up would stop. <laughs> the ladders would be removed from the from the steps would be removed from the ladder and uh, and you don't hear of them. So I'm sure there are many in the earlier stages that are purged. And, you know, that largely was happening to me in my comedy career. I mean, I, I had been a success, successful in that I could make a career. Uh, touring comedian, but I was essentially never offered positions on television, even, you know, five minutes on the late night shows, despite the fact that I was headlining the comedy clubs in New York City and 
you know, doing all of the things that you would expect uh, the, to, to have that be the next step of my career is, you know, Comedy Central and stuff like that. But I got very few of those chances. And so the system was working correctly. It was stopping someone who was outside of the Overton window, who was, ant who was anti-capitalist, anti-imperial uh, from getting a larger platform. But then RT kind of fucked up the equation for them. And I ended up with a TV show on, on national and international television. And eventually, uh, you know, for a long time, they just did it with shadow banning, that kind of subtle suppression that many people didn't even believe us when we'd say I, I became shadow banned on Facebook, which was my main platform used to be uh, in 2016. And back then, people didn't believe us. They, uh, what do you mean shadow banned? What do you mean people aren't seeing your posts? So you're just not as popular as you used to be. But it was it was quite obvious. And but eventually, even that small amount of influence that I guess RT was still having, RT America, uh, was too much. And they and they shut it all down and banned along with banning my YouTube. They banned my uh, podcast from Spotify, which I've now renamed the Lee Camp show so that it could be on Spotify. So they haven't banned that yet. But uh, yeah, so it's it's you know, it's it's a long process of kind of uh in a way, self-censorship, but I guess it, it also is censorship by the by the entities that purge the people that might be uh, pushing outside the Overton window. Well, just to hop in with a very quick quote before I let you go, Brett, or at least a paraphrasing of a quote. And this is a very famous quote from Noam Chomsky. This is uh, from sometime in the 90s, I want to say. Um, and by the way, listeners, we have an episode with Noam Chomsky and Vijay Prashad. You can find that on podcast feeds anywhere. But this is when discussing, um, you know, media and censorship in the media and narratives in the media. The interviewer said to Chomsky something along the lines of, nobody's telling me what to say. I'm not getting narratives pushed on me. And Noam Chomsky says, you know, I believe you. I believe that nobody's giving you instructions. I believe that what you're saying, you're saying with the utmost conviction. But I also firmly believe that you would not be sitting where you are right now if you didn't believe these things. Brett, right. go ahead. Right. It's kind of like when people would ask me, even when I was at Redacted tonight, when John Stewart was leaving, then when Trevor Noah was leaving, they'd say, oh my God, Lee Camp is the obvious choice for The Daily Show. Now, I know plenty of people don't believe that, but I always found that funny when a fan would say that. I'd be like, you still don't understand how this system works. I'm not on anyone's list for The Daily Show. <laughs> <laughs> you would have been a much better host, I just have to say. Um, but but I just want to say really quick before I get into my point about censorship, bouncing off your point, Lee. I used to listen to you like 12 years ago. I was washing dishes in a pizza place in my early 20s. And I remember listening to you um, on Progressive Podcasts. And I know you had your own little shows at the time. So it's kind of surreal 12 years later to, to be talking oh, cool. with you, but you, you go back and I, I really appreciate your work for a long time. It was influential on me. Um, but oh, I did want to yeah, of course. I did want to say just an interesting little point about the censorship is lately, especially as, as of late, especially during COVID, it's the reactionary right that claims this mantle of being silenced. They're the ones that are the most loud about being shut down and being censored. And often they're censored for like racial slurs or denying science or just, you know, not ever really challenging power in any substantial way, like misgendering a trans person just to be right. edgy. And then you get banned and then you play the victim forever. But it's people who are, I don't know, fighting for Palestinian rights, um, who challenge uh, U.S. imperialism on a mainstream platform, who actually have a class critique. Those people are on the left and they're actually challenging power. And one of the strategies that the liberal center uses to silence that is this horseshoe theory, this attempt to unite and say that the far left is the same as the far right, right? A horseshoe sort of goes around and bends towards each other. You go far enough left, you end up on the right. right. And so while everybody is sickened and repulsed by the far right, proud boys, fascist Nazis, for the liberal centrists, they can say, well, these communists, these socialists, these anarchists, these, these uh, anti-imperialist progressives you know, they're actually, you know, they're quite the same. Bernie is like just like a Donald Trump because they can't take our arguments head on. They can take the rights arguments head on because it's conspiracy nonsense. It's racism. It's most people are repulsed by it. They can't take on the anti-imperialist and anti-capitalist critique. And so they must instead tar and feather us with the horseshoe theory saying we're more like the far right than anything else. And that alone is oftentimes sufficient. But it's often mm -hmm. the people on the left actually challenge, challenging power that actually face real consequences 
um, for their for their um, for their views, not those on the right, although the right have been much better at claiming to be the victim of censorship. Yeah, it is. Uh, you know, and I, I suppose I have a particular fascination in the comedians who claim to be censored. But it is funny that the the ones who who people point to is, oh, they've been they've been deleted or, or blocked or banned. And I'm not talking about the ones who sexually assaulted people. Uh, I'm talking about the ones who supposedly were were uh, were deleted or canceled for things they said. Most of the time, it's not true at all. It's you know, they point to Joe Rogan or Dave Chappelle. And I'm like, these people are on the <laughs> largest platforms in the world. <laughs> they're getting they have hundred million dollar deals and they're, they've been canceled. How have they been canceled? Meanwhile, I, you know, am much smaller and I literally, my YouTube has been <laughs> deleted. Like it's, it's, it's that, but they're better at playing the victim. And, you know, so that, that uh, point gets pushed around or whatever. Well, that politics of victimhood comes back to our previous conversation about how history can be used as pro propaganda and distorted. I mean, when you think of it, um, really one of the constitutive elements of far right political thinking is historical grievances against some imagined community that has suffered these unfortunate or terrible injustices and oppression. And you look to, you know, the uh, 20s and 30s, and especially after the, um, you know, Great Depression, you know, Nazi ideology was developed principally through this idea of Germans being victims uh, because of the war reparations and the final, you know, treaty agreements um, at Versailles and so on. And so this idea of being the victims, oftentimes ignoring others who have been, you know, who've suffered is a very exclusive, you know, narrative of historical grievance that then fuels a politics around it of uh, you know vengeance and a, and, a, and a grievance and sometimes the analysis can actually hit upon some of the existing uh, inequalities or um, abuses of the system. I mean, of course, everybody's suffering under capitalism today. You know, corporate capitalism and wealth inequality. But you find that there's this skewed and distorted analysis of those conditions uh, to uh, you know kind of exaggerate the victimhood of people on cultural bases on you know these kinds of social and cultural orientations and practices rather than the material conditions you know of corporate america and capitalism and the abuse of workers you never find um, any of these right wing media hosts or people who are talking about what's happened to america in the last 30 or 40 years talking about how we need more of a labor movement. You know, they're never in favor of right. labor unions. They find this sense of grievance that might actually sometimes, sometimes it's totally fictive and in a distorted history. And sometimes it's built upon genuine, you know, conditions. But instead of actually having a materialist analysis of these conditions, it goes to this level of culture. And that's one thing that I wanted to say about history as propaganda, is that when it is purely idealist in orientation, and it just picks up on those kinds of ideas and cultural dimensions, it's very easy for it to distort and, you know, reverse you know, the actual power relations that are taking place. And that's partly what it accomplishes, as Brett was saying, nationalism and nationalist ideology is fundamentally a kind of anti-class viewpoint, mm -hmm. you know, and kind of, you know, creating a sense of community and identity that erases class differences as illegitimate, as historical you know, objects of analysis to really see how is our society working. And so, I would say, you know, one of the reasons why we created Guerrilla History Podcast was uh, not only to confront the propaganda by analyzing it, but to promote an idea that uh, a more liberatory approach to history is one that is internationalist rather than, say, nationalist, is humanist rather than particularist, and is materialist rather than idealist and sort of clouding things through the sense of cultural or social 
you know, differences or issues and ideas, but rather to clarify the forms of solidarity that we actually should have by analyzing these struggles from a materialist and a global internationalist perspective. And um, we hope that by doing so, then people can find those affiliations and those connections uh, to, uh, you know, forge a different path. That's, that's the hope and the idea, because um, I think history, as I had said, is so important in our sense of identity. It's kind of what we take for granted as the narratives of who we are. Uh, and if we don't change those and start not only change the narratives that we have, but also start thinking about these things in a different way, materialist and internationalist, I think, you know, it's going to be very hard to make genuine progress. And, and really all, quick, all uh, right points. Yeah. yeah, just to just to chime in on that, one thing the right does uh, really well is this twofold strategy. One, it, it it the right wing populism, right wing you know aggravation, agitation. It's always uh, geared towards taking your eyes off those with actual money and power in most cases, and aiming your ire and hatred for the unsavory conditions we're living in towards the most marginalized, towards the most vulnerable. But when the right does attack the elites, right, this anti-elite discourse you'll often hear on the right, right, it's not the owning class. It's not the military industrial complex. It's a certain subsect of the ruling class, basically liberal cosmopolitans. They don't have a problem with capitalism, with imperialism, even with the basic structures that create the very problems they're reacting to. They scapegoat to keep their eyes off the people with real money and power, especially on their side. And then they posture as anti-elitists or that they actually have a critique of those in power by simply taking a subsection of the elite, the liberal elite that don't agree with them ideologically, and then throwing conspiracies, whatever, you know, they eat babies, whatever else nonsense can come out. Um, and But that anti-elitist posture, especially when compared to the center left, who doesn't talk like that, can be alluring to people who don't right. like these conditions, but don't have a full understanding, don't have a materialist analysis of history, how class plays into this, et cetera. And so it gives them an outlet for their anti-elitism. But while they do that, it pushes them to the right. And it makes, I don't know, stuff like the LGBTQ community puppets of the liberal elite, right? So then you can hate the LGBT community, even though they have no power, because they are tied up with the liberal cosmopolitan globalist elite. And these are their foot soldiers, right? Um, and so that's the way I think uh, the right co-ops anti-ruling uh, class rhetoric, but then strips it of its actual bite and, and, and serves their purposes. And most of their examples yeah. of the global, you know, corporate elite, they're really focusing on industries of the culture, the culture industries and social media companies. And so it's and I'm not saying that the social media and Hollywood aren't important and have a major effect. Of course, they actually make a lot of propaganda, you know, as well. Right. And we were talking about censorship and the way in which this is a ground to be contested, you know, these platforms on social media. But they ignore the real productive, you know, elements in society that are driving the economy and, 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 and inequality. They don't focus on the really the heads of global corporations, the fossil fuel companies, the, you know, military right. arms manufacturers you, and the surveillance. You, you will essentially never hear Tucker Carlson say something about big ag or usually even big oil or any of those. That's right. Well, not to mention, not to mention the exploited masses in other countries. This is one of the reasons that also, we also run guerrilla histories. We can focus on these other regions and talk about how imperialism from not only the United States, but in the modern day, largely the United States. Of course, historically, there was many other epochs of imperialism. But how imperialism, neocolonialism, settler colonialism, all of these different concepts come together to exploit and extract value from people around the world. These are narratives that you do not hear in mainstream discourse in the United States or in the developed West more generally. If you did... People would have to come to grips with the fact that even though, you know, yeah, they don't like these cultural elites in their country, it, it's, it's the capitalist class of their country that is not only holding them down, but is also much more exploiting and holding down the people elsewhere, and that their relative position is actually much better than these people that are being exploited in other countries. You know, we've talked about the labor aristocracy on our show many times. I'm not going to get into that right now. I just wanted to chime in with the fact that, you know, even in places like the United States, people that are 
uh, thinking a little bit beyond the typical, uh, it's a cultural elite, you know, when they start to think about who's owning the corporations within this country, they still fail to make that connection with exploitation abroad with their material benefit due to that exploitation that's taking place. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think I'll jump to my next question, which I guess my first one was uh, excessively broad about the past, and I'll switch to excessively broad about the future. Uh, I want to know what your what what you guys um, what your view is on on how and and you know you don't have to have the answer, but maybe just some uh, some ideas on how to get beyond capitalism and does it require a societal collapse or could it be an evolution to a a better and sustainable structure. Um, what what does that look like? Because I know there are there are debates on this. You know, some believe that you you build up what you want to see, such as uh, you know uh, democracy in the workplace and things like that, and then it will uh, evolve into getting beyond capitalism. And then uh, others believe it uh, is uh, that that won't do it. So I I'd like to hear your take. I I, I would say the first thing is that it won't be a, a natural evolution from within capitalism itself. Um, you can't just build enough co-ops and then, you know, quantity becomes quality and all of a sudden we have socialism. What it will always require is a fight. And mm -hmm. we can kind of look back over the, the transition from feudalism to capitalism to see not only is it a brutal process of, of changing one mode of production to another, but it's also a protracted one. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in the context of one collapse. There are pushes forward. There are retreats. Um, and but I think the difference here is that while the transition from feudalism to capitalism was happening, there was pretty much nobody with a meta perspective on on the modes of production and how they evolved. They didn't necessarily see themselves as fighting for the next mode of production. It was sort of more organic, whereas now because of critical theory, because of Marxism, because of a historical understanding of history, we can kind of see ourselves as living at the end of this mode of production and pushing for this new mode of production, which I think is at least psychologically probably different than the transition from feudalism to capitalism. But I will also say that with climate change and just with the nature of capitalism itself, crises are inevitable. And every time there is a crisis, a big crisis, whether it's national or international in the capitalist system, there are opportunities. It's not always the opportunity for full on socialist revolution, um, but there are opportunities to advance our claims, advance the ball for our class, get in the streets, et cetera. But ultimately, because, and, and this links up with the labor aristocracy, because we're in the imperial core, and I don't want to sound like a crazy third worldist here, but I don't necessarily think that the transition from so, from capitalism to socialism is going to be catalyzed and the, and the impetus happening in the imperial core. I think what's more likely is the global system of capitalism mixed with climate change continues to push uh, create more and more crises that are more heavily felt in mm. places without the resources to deal with them and yeah. those people having less to lose and not having so much of their wealth built on the exploitation of others will likely move in a more socialist direction out of self-preservation and rationality and that will create an interesting global context maybe another split like we saw during the cold war even where the imperialist bloc led by the US is doing everything it can to prevent the rise of a more or less organic revolutionary movements, movements, plural, throughout the throughout the global south. But right. the important thing is it will always be a fight and we can never, ever soothe ourselves into thinking we can do it through reform. It's an evolutionary process. We can't fool ourselves into thinking it's determined and that it's going to happen. And importantly, I don't think we can fool ourselves into believing that a collapse will lead to socialism. If we have a brutal collapse in the U.S., maybe multiple climate change disasters happening at once or a complete Great Depression reboot, right, a, a complete economic breakdown, because of the ideological positioning and posturing of the average American, because of ideological hegemony, I don't think the people's first response is let's hit the streets and create an egalitarian society. <laughs> I think fear is going to kick in. Reaction is going to kick in. Splitting up between, you know, races or religions is going to kick in. There's going to be brutal fascist movements. And it could very well go more in the direction of barbarism than into the direction of, of socialism. Um, so I, I don't think that uh, we should we should fetishize collapse as being the impetus. 
Um, it certainly opens up opportunities, but it also opens up opportunities for the far right. Look at Weimar Republic um, after, you know, World War One in Germany. There was a there was a much more robust communist movement in Germany than there is in the United States right now. Mm -hmm. And they had good leadership, good structures. They were embedded in the unions and they still lost. Um, and so I think that that's a humbling historical reality uh, that we're going to have to we're going to have to wrestle with and deal with. And I think in the meantime, we have to get as prepared as we can for the many crises that are inevitably he heading our way. I was hoping you'd just say recycle our plastic bags. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, there's, you know, Brett really, I think, made some excellent points there. I mean, I think the first thing we could say, though, is that it seems like in some ways, some people analyze the situation and, and would suggest that we are moving into a transition to something else, whatever that else is going to be. And although we know there have been different stages and histories within capitalism that it has adapted and changed. Um, I think we're at a point where, um, you know, there are some pretty fundamental changes taking place and nobody really knows what is post-capitalism going to look like. Um, you know, some argue like Yanis Varoufakis that, you know, we're already really past capitalism and we're in some other formation that's a lot like feudalism in its structure. But of course, it's in a techno modern, you know, mm -hmm. way with this, you know, new technology and where we're providing data on ourselves and creating value simply by, you know, sharing, you know, on social media and so on. And that, you know, there's some transformation that's happened where the power is really in the hands of a few who don't need markets. They don't, con you know, they control the markets. Like the market isn't really a space where this kind of classical well, capitalism is taking place. It's all pure monopoly. And I heard, and I heard it called uh, plutonomy uh, where, it's kind of like what the 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 finances of the bottom whatever fifty or eighty percent don't matter almost at all, and it just becomes the money of the ultra rich is is what's I don't know holding the structure right. together. Right, and also like you know with automation and less dependence on labor, you know, um, eventually or ultimately when they've squeezed everything they can, you know, there are surplus populations, you know that. You know, they just don't want to be responsible for, as it were. And so, you know, that vision of really apocalyptic uh, kinds of ugly movements and violence and instability is certainly a very real possibility. I mean, it's happening in various ways already in people's lives in the third world and so on with the disasters of climate change, with the effects of, you know, neoliberalism. But I think one thing that we're seeing also that I think is a predicate um, and prelude to some potential change is this multipolarity, you know, on the geopolitical front, you know, having different kinds of powers within the global capitalist system makes it more unstable. And although it doesn't itself mean that those will turn into the socialist future of, you know, equality uh, that we all hope, it does mean that there are those opportunities, I think, that Brett was uh, mentioning, because it undermines the purely controlling neoliberal dominance that the United States and Europe, basically the Anglo-European kind of world, has dominated um, for the last 30, 40 years. So there are going to be some you know, opportunities. I, my fear is, however, that those right-wing forces seem to have organized themselves a lot more uh, quickly. And um, you see the rise of neo-fascist, ultra-nationalist, far-right movements emerging globally, whether it's Hindutva in India, whether it's, you know, in Eastern Europe and Hungary and Poland with the anti-immigrant kind of politics that has fueled far-right there, that the populism uh, and reaction that we're seeing um, you know, okay, Bolsonaro just lost, but those forces have not gone away there either. So there's been a real international mobilization of ultranationalists far right. And the strange thing is, is that there may be ways, just as there were during the kind of Axis powers where, you know, competing racial imperialist ideologies nonetheless still found a way to work together and make a compact, you know, that despite the way in which you would think that ultranationalism should mean that they don't affiliate with other nations and, and you know, look only to their self-interests, 
but they are capable, it seems, of seeing some kind of broader alliance of, of uh, fascistic sorts of forces. I mean, Bannon, you know, was trying to create something like that, you know, yeah. with the Trump sort of thing. He was imagining, hey, we could really bring in, you know, Russia um, as a kind of conservative country um, that stands against this, uh, you know, CRT type, you know, neoliberal, um, cosmopolitan, globalist, social justice, social identity elite. They stand with us and they're also Christian. We could create a kind of Christian. It was like basically updating Samuel Huntington's clash of civilizations theory and trying to apply it to geopolitics for the far right, um, you know, in the, in the future. That's what he was looking for, it seemed, as a kind of, um, you know, uh, isolate China as the big real problem, which is also what Huntington says, I mean, in The Clash of Civilizations. I really think actually The Clash of Civilizations, that book is sort of like a handbook for the kind of right-wing intellectual envisioning of the future, really. And interestingly enough, again, it is based on a fundamentally bizarre form of history, is that he invokes these ideas of culture and their development as separate so-called civilizations that have to be hostile to one another, that have no way to really cooperate and work together, is fundamentally grounded for him in their separate histories. Um, and so they've taken the sort of playbook uh, from that where, where he identifies the Islamic world. And we saw this with the global war on terrorism as sort of a kind of clash of civilizations that people wanted to kind of frame this as. And China as the real, um, you know, as the real kind of problem for Western, you know, so-called Western civilization. And that's uh, what I fear is that there are some sort of far right affiliations, even among these different ultra nationalists that um, are reacting against the neoliberal uh, globalization of the last, uh, you know, 30 or 40 years. And the left has not really started thinking as internationally with how we would affiliate our social movements, how we would work and show solidarity for workers around the world. I mean, if Brett is correct, and I think he had a good, great point, if conditions will be so bad and the opportunities may be in the global South, you know, what is the responsibility then for people of the left in the imperial core? What should we be doing? Um, we have to think about that, I think, about how we can assist and engage with those movements, because maybe it won't, the structure of capitalism and the forces that we would have to deal with, we're not in a position, we're not so organized to be able to take on, um, you know, the, the capitalist elite in our, in our, uh, in our countries, in, the, in, in Canada, United States, Europe, but what can we do um, to promote, to affiliate, to connect, to support? What are our responsibilities as well? You know, uh, if we think internationally rather and globally rather than, you know, just uh, in our own national context, what could we do? Just to pick up on that briefly, and I, I will be brief because I really could talk about this topic alone for an hour, but uh, <laughs> I'll try not to. Uh, but I, I think that Brett and Adnan are both saying very, very important things. And I just want to add one little wrinkle into it. So when Brett says that uh, the crisis is inevitable, crises are inevitable. This is something that we know. There are cycles of crisis baked into the system of capitalism. We've seen this time and time again. Sometimes we try have a movement that tries to supersede capitalism. Other times the reaction to movements manages to hold together capitalism for a little bit longer. It really depends on what context you're looking at. I also think that Adnan talking about looking at different contexts internationally is of critical importance. You can't just think, okay, the context of me living in the United States, not, not me, but you, know, right. you and Brett, uh, the context of me living in the United States is going to be the same as uh, somebody in Kenya. No, it's, it's very, very different. That's why we have to take on board what are these revolutionaries and these thinkers in different places trying to theorize is their way of superseding and going beyond capitalism to the next phase of human society. We have to take that on board and think, 
given the situation that we're in, how do we promote that? How do we promote national liberation struggles worldwide? You know, how can you do that from your context? I know uh, I mentioned that we had interviewed Comrade Joma, the founding chairman of the Communist Party of the Philippines before. We asked him this question. His response, which he said was all hypothetical, um, although Comrade Joma sadly passed, so he probably, you know, he would be willing to say we can scratch the hypothetical part of it at this point, was for people that have technical knowledge of weaponry to transmit that technical knowledge to the, the, uh, the, communist guerrilla movement in the Philippines. You know, is that what you want to do? You you think about it, but you have to consider, you know, what can you do given your background, your expertise to be able to aid these movements that will help us get past capitalism. But the one thing that I really want to add in more than anything else on this topic, and I think that it's it's probably the most critically important thing for people to take out of this, this conception of what do we do to move beyond capitalism is that I agree with Brett entirely that you can't reform your way out of capitalism. You can't just say more co-ops, more co-ops, and poof, all of a sudden it's socialism. But I also want to highlight the fact that you cannot wait for a collapse. This is something that people that are very nihilistic may have a tendency to do, and, and also people that don't have a conception or don't have the impetus to do anything in their own personal lives to try to push for superseding capitalism, if there's no external force on them, they're not going to have the impetus to push against the society to try to move to a new phase of society. We cannot wait for collapse. There are crises, but we cannot wait for collapse. Instead, we should be looking for points of rupture. And you can read that as revolution as, as you want. Um, and of course, I'm not saying that I'm a thought leader. I'm not telling you, you know, we have to be doing protracted people's war or socialism in one state or permanent revolution or some sort of anarchist conception of how to move beyond capitalism. I am not the one who's going to be telling you what the correct route of action is in each individual case. That is for you to do in your organizations and in your political parties. But what we have to understand is that we do have to find these points of weakness. We do have to do what we can to cause that rupture. And then, as Marx famously said when he was looking at the example of the Paris Commune, you can't just take the ready-made state machinery and think that you can utilize that for socialism. No, you have to then fundament fundamentally transform society for socialism and on the route to communism, a stateless, classless society. So, again... Put that notion of waiting for collapse out of your head because it, it just allows you to get rid of any sort of, of impetus on yourself in terms of, um, you know, the necessity of you to actually do anything. Mm -hmm. You do have to do what you can. If you don't, we are never going to get there. You have to think of what you can do in your situation. Yeah, all, all excellent points. Um, by the way, I don't mind going uh, 10 minutes over if needed, but uh, I, don't, I don't know if we... Uh wanted to jump to one of your questions. Yeah, I had a question for you. It really kind of picks up on this. I mean, uh, Henry was just talking about how we have to do what we can within our own uh, sphere. And of course, we mentioned why we started Guerrilla History is because we think, you know, historical knowledge, real historical knowledge, you know, uh, can be a weapon, can be an organizing tool, can be uh, a weapon in 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 class struggle. Um, but, you know, you're... Um, somebody who comments on the news and does so as a comedian as well. And so I was kind of curious, you know, from your position, um, how you see your show contributing to that same outcome that we're all, you know, interested uh, in seeing a fairer, or juster world. Um, and um, how do you distinguish your kinds of comedic critique of news and politics from some of the others? Um, and whether it has anything to do with um, being more connected with or aspiring, you know, for it to be inspirational to activism and activists. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so it, I, I think part of it is you, you never know. And, you know, this goes for comedy, but it goes for everything. You, you never really know the, the full ramifications or ripple effects of, of what you do and what you put out there. And, you know, luckily we now live in some level of information revolution, even if they're trying to shut it down, uh, where you can influence, you know, thousands and often millions of people and, you know, never meet any of them. And never really know how, how it ends, how it ends up. Uh, apparently I helped inspire Brett a little, 
uh, back in the day. So, it, it, you know, those kind of things I, I am very aware of and, you know, keep me going when, uh, when uh, I'm, I'm being, uh, you know, I'm having my TV shows canceled and the such. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I do, I do think in terms of my particular style and, and what I do, uh, you know, there, there, are different, there are different styles of comedy and some of them may have political messaging in them to some level, but I don't think they're actually changing many minds. Uh, you know, a good example, and I think it was one of the best written comedy shows to ever exist, uh, and, I, and I loved it, was The Colbert Rapport. Uh, I, I, it's, in terms of comedy writing, it, it was some of the best that I think ever existed. And yet I don't think it actually changed many minds because right wingers could watch it and kind of not get the joke or just enjoy the snarky lines about liberals and uh, liberals could watch it and, and think everything's a joke and nothing really needs to be changed. And Colbert in interviews has said that that he never really wanted to influence people and, and, and uh, that kind of upsets people to hear that he didn't want to change things, but he kind of was just doing comedy and he ended up in the political comedy realm. And, and, you know, I, I have times in my comedy where it's more or less satirical. It's more or less taking the opposite of what I actually mean. But if I do that too much or, or too fully, uh, I don't think it actually informs people. And so I am very aware of that. And that may actually decrease the number of viewers, but I don't actually care because I want to have some impact. Uh, and so I would often, you know, if I, I would do a long, you know, 10 minutes at the opening of Redacted Tonight on a topic. But then in the last, uh, uh, you know, 30 seconds, I would make it very clear what my point was. Uh, in case there was anyone out there who was still thinking that my satirical lines might be genuine and, and uh, you know, maybe he really thinks we should uh, bomb the world because it uh, will be a nice fireworks display or whatever. Uh, so I, I am aware of, of the fact that the comedy can be, can sound like it's making a point and actually change little to no minds. Um, and, but it can also be, very important in changing minds if it's if it's done correctly. So I, I think that that's part of what makes me a little different than a lot of political comedians. But the other thing is there really just aren't that many people in America doing what I do. I, I mean, and I won't speak for other countries. Maybe it's the same for other countries as well. But I always expected when I was started doing more left wing comedy that, oh, I'd have just scores of people that I was competing against to be the the better one. But there just aren't that many. There's plenty that do a little bit of politics. There's plenty of comedians, you know, thousands with five minutes of Trump jokes or whatever. But in terms of actually getting at the deeper core issues, actually getting to, to, to what capitalism is or getting to uh, the, the details of our endless wars and things like it, it's almost non-existent. So, you know, with the exception, exception of a handful and so I, you know, that's good for my career. It's terrible for the world that there aren't more people doing it. But. <laughs> well, one thing I did notice in the, in the comedy space, and I'm certainly no expert on comedy, but I do enjoy it as a, as a fan is the, the, the co comedians that have like right now, huge shows um, that are the most successful. You can think of, I mean, Joe Rogan, uh, you can think of Dave Chappelle, you can think of Bill Maher, right? Mm -hmm. Millions of people in their audiences, millions of dollars in their pockets and Chappelle is an interesting version here because there was a time when Chappelle threw comedy, although it wasn't explicitly political, it was cultural, it was social. Right. It was saying something about American racism. Of course, you know, his, his sort of uh, breakdown in the industry and fleeing to, to Africa in part was because some of the white people in his audience didn't get the irony. They were right. taking it seriously, like a right winger watching Colbert, like this is just like Bill O'Reilly. You know, he didn't. And so he had a sort of crisis. Yep. But now you see them and you see what happens when they get incredibly comfortable money wise. This mm -hmm. happens in music too, and in hip hop and in other yes. things. Yes, totally. They get so comfortable. And now what is their, all three of them, um, what is their biggest gripe about the, what's the biggest problem in the world for all of them? It's wokeism. Because when you are so comfortable, when you have millions and millions and millions of dollars, you are 
Your family is set for generations. You are completely extracted over time from the real issues that working class people face. Mm -hmm. And of course, they have these huge platforms. They obviously had some talent to get to where they are. I'm not trying to take that away from them. But because they're so cloistered, they're so comfortable, their number one problem in the world is like people's pronouns and like blue haired kids on college campuses. (laughs) And that just and they have a huge audience. And then you have like people making 30K a year thinking wokeism is the biggest problem in America right now. Right. Um, and so I don't know how that dovetails precisely with what you're saying, but it does go to show at as people's class position um, moves, they get away from the real issues that, that impact regular people in the streets and they can get off into these very cloistered conversations about things that ultimately are not that serious and are not that important. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely true. And you're right that he did used to have uh, more interesting and important points to make on race. And uh, and often with black comedians, they're often not called political comedians simply because they're black. But I would say I haven't watched his stuff recently, but I would say someone like Chris Rock was very much a political comedian. And when he was influencing me, I'm talking his specials back in the 90s. Uh, he was saying some some very important things. Uh, such as, and you know, I was young enough at the time that I didn't, th- I-, I thought this was a joke. I didn't realize just how accurate he was being, but he was taught in bigger blackery, a, a, a whole bit on how they'll never cure AIDS because the money's not in the cure. The money's in the, he called it the comeback, but the money's in people just getting by. And that's how you keep funding your drugs. Uh, and keep making money. And it's absolutely true. I mean, now we have the actual proof of leaked memos from Goldman Sachs telling their top investors not to fund single, uh, uh, you know, gene therapy, like like single uh, use or whatever uh, 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 cures, because it, there's no continued revenue stream. Uh, so it's, it, it actually was 100% accurate. But but um but yeah, I, I think you're right that they often get so removed from it. Uh, and, and, and the other thing is, I don't know what they're, when you get to that level of comedy, I, I can't speak to it. I don't know what the people around them are saying. I mean, you can have a whole brand specialist that will uh, tell you, oh, well, this bit, you know, that'll alienate you with A, B, and C. And uh, this is a little awkward for, and so the, it's possible that things are actually removed from, from specials. Uh, comedy specials, et cetera, because it could alienate people. And, and most of these guys know where their, their, their bread is buttered. And when they don't, uh, there's another step to, to extracting anything that might, uh, you know, alienate or push away the corporate elite that are, that are paying their checks. I remember I read the book. It was after Jon Stewart quit the daily show and they put out a book on the inside the daily show. And, you know, some of it was fascinating, but uh, uh, the most fascinating thing in it to me was one page where they discussed the fact that there's an actual member on staff whose job it is, if they're going to insult any corporation that's connected to the show, which, you know, Viacom owns A, B, and C. So basically every corporation somehow connected to the to Comedy Central. If they were going to say anything that would alienate or, or insult any of them, this person was t- job was to call up that company and, you know, whoever the press person is or whatever, and try and convince them that it was fun to be made fun of on The Daily Show. And the implication was, if they didn't get the approval from something like Walmart, they couldn't tell the joke. And some of the time the company said, sure, sounds fun, and but plenty of times I'm sure they didn't. And that that's how you control the narrative. That's how you make sure that there may be a light joke about Walmart. There's not going to be an in-depth analysis of how Walmart destroys towns, you know, on a daily basis. So I guess, shall we? Uh, well, I guess uh, one, one quick thing, since you mentioned HIV and, uh, you know, curing it is not where the money is. Um, as you mentioned at the beginning of the show, my training is actually in immunobiology, even though I'm not in the field of science at the moment. And well, I'm much happier for it, to be quite honest with you. And uh, mm-hmm. people know me for doing guerrilla history and not because I was an immunobiologist. But within the last week, the state of Tennessee just uh, announced that they would refuse federal grant money regarding HIV AIDS. So every year, Tennessee gets about $10 million in federal grant money for testing, prevention, and treatment of HIV AIDS. Now we have to understand HIV AIDS, 
people some some people still have the notion of HIV AIDS from the 80s and early 90s where right. it was essentially a death sentence and you know it was like the silent killer and one day you'd find out you had it and then you would write your will because you were essentially going to die after that point. This is not the case anymore. Mm. Um, you know, testing is pretty darn cheap and if you subsidize it, it's free. Uh, PrEP is a thing that exists, is very successful. This is preventative treatment, so um, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, this is something that is very cheap, very effective, and again, you can subsidize, and especially if you target it towards communities that are most at risk for contracting HIV. Treatment is relatively successful these days. AIDS is by no means a death sentence at this mm -hmm. point. But what we have to remember is that who suffers predominantly from HIV and AIDS? It is the most marginalized communities. And the people that are going to be suffering from these diseases are the people that would benefit the most from having federal funding and subsidies for programs like this. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, I know that that wasn't really the point of the last conversation. I have very little to add. Uh, in I'm, I, I'm enjoying it. So <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, I'll go out and say it. your show is the only comedy show I pretty much ever watched. So I am not the expert on comedy, but <laughs> I can say this with regards to HIV AIDS. But the, the speculation now is that some of these other um, right wing controlled states may do the same thing. And the question I, you know, I'm not going to answer the question for people, but think why, why are states like Tennessee and potentially others going to just say, no, we don't want federal grant money for testing prevention and treatment of something like HIV AIDS, which if you do these three things, you have virtually nobody dying from it. Why would you cut this federal funding? Why would you just refuse it? Say, no, I don't want this $10 million to, you know, earmark it for these vulnerable populations. Why? Think about it, audience. Yeah. Well, I have thoroughly enjoyed this. Uh, uh, as, as I think someone said, we easily could have done uh, uh, two or three hours, but uh, I really appreciate talking with you guys. I appreciate you taking the time. And uh, everybody definitely has to check out Guerrilla History Podcast. And uh, yeah, I don't know if there's anything else you want to tell people on where to follow your work. Yeah, uh, I'll have my co-hosts also tell people where they can find them on Twitter. Uh, but I will just announce that, you know, you can find Guerrilla History wherever you get your podcasts. Brett has two other excellent podcasts. Adnan has another podcast. We just launched a spin-off show as well. You can find all of our work um, linked on Twitter at gorilla underscore pod. That's G-U-E-R-R-I-L-L-A underscore pod. If you type it with only one R, oftentimes it doesn't come up. But I want to encourage the listeners, particularly if you're going to jump into our catalog, we have an ongoing mini series called Sanctions as War, something that is really overlooked. Uh, yeah especially in the Western, uh, even Western left, we don't talk about um, sanctions nearly enough. And I know that this hits me particularly as I live in Russia, which is one of the most sanctioned countries in the world right now. And we are seeing impacts of it, even if not as severe as many thought that they would be. But our sanctions is war theory takes a theoretical look at sanctions and also is doing uh, installments on case studies. So, you know, Cuba, we just put out one on China. Um, we have all kinds of case studies and we're going to be coming out with more. I think the next one that we might do, oh, we'll have Iraq coming out next week uh, and Zimbabwe sometime shortly thereafter. So if you want to check out something uh, and you don't have like a specific gift, uh, guest in mind, you know, oh, Richard Wolf was on there. I want to check that out. Sure. If you have a guest that we've interviewed that you want to check out, go for that. Otherwise, I would recommend starting with the Sanctions is Worth series and you might find some interest in that, particularly the fact that it is really an international perspective. Brett and Adnan, how can the listeners... Oh, and I guess Twitter for me, you can find me at Huck1995, H-U-C-K-1995. Guys? Yeah, I'll just start and say thank you so much, Lee, for having us on. Uh, love talking with you. Love all your work. Keep it up. And honestly, I love the, the audience as well. You've cultivated a really wonderful audience. I was kind of following some of the comments. Very smart people. Um, you can find everything I personally do at revolutionaryleftradio.com. That's all three podcasts and socials and everything else. I want to ditto. Uh, it was really a lot of fun. Great to meet you, Lee, and also a great audience. I've been watching the uh, YouTube chat, so a lot of fun. I love the chat always on a good show. A lot of great conversation happens there. So uh, kudos, and hopefully uh, the show gets bigger and uh, 
and better all the time. People can reach me um, on Twitter at Adnan A. Hussein, H-U-S-A-I-N. And again, it was just a real pleasure. Thanks so much, Lee. Thanks so much, guys. I'll see you down the road. All right, folks, there it is. Hope you enjoyed that. The guys from Guerrilla History Pod. Uh, such a pleasure to have them. Folks, this what, what we do here with Buying the Headlines is completely funded by you. We have no sponsors or anything like that. It's all down to you guys and whether you want to see this continue and you know see great guests like we just recently, they mentioned Richard Wolf. I had Richard Wolf recently, uh, Stella Assange, Julian Assange's wife recently, Medea Benjamin, co-founder of Code Pink. All of those great people have been on and that's just the past couple of weeks. And that's all at youtube.com slash Behind the Headlines. Uh, you can now, this is new, uh, you can now click the join button next to where it says either Mint Press or uh, behind the headlines on YouTube. You can click the join button and I think it's $4.99 and you'll get uh, a bunch of, hold on, I had it here somewhere. You'll get a bunch of cool, cool shit if you uh, sign up. You get loyalty badges and emojis, member only chat rooms, prioritize comments and followed back by Mint Press News, among other things. So that is a new way that they are uh, helping uh, fund this show and keep this going. So you can join there. You can also join patreon.com slash behind the headlines. And I will see you tomorrow. I'm talking to Jing Jing Li, a great journalist for CGTN. And she also has other shows as well. She's hugely popular and she's going to be talking to us about China and the propaganda against China. And uh, yeah, other than that, I will see you soon. And Keep fighting.